Hello everyone, Eric Chappell, Civil Community Evangelist for Autodesk, and I'm here today with Buddy Legnan, uh, Plant Solutions Subject Matter Expert for Autodesk. And um, Buddy's the star of our show. He's going to talk to you today about water and sewage treatment plant design <clears throat> using Autodesk Plant 3D. So that's the part of the uh, presentation we're really looking forward to. Um, before we get started, though, I just wanted to share a few things about our webcast series and about our civil engineering community. Uh, first of all, this series, if, you're, if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, we do this on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. Try to stick to that schedule as much as we can. And we've been doing this in April. It'll be three years. Um, so we've got a, a huge library of, of prior webcast recordings that you can look through. I'll show you some details on how to get to those in just a moment. But, um, you know, like I said, this is something we've been doing for a while. The, the main goal is to bring you folks, the users of our products, a little closer with us, the makers of the products, learn more about them, kind of get an idea what's on our mind and, and what we're thinking about when we release the different features of the products and uh, give you the perspective oftentimes of the product team, but um, a lot of times as well, we also have guest speakers. Um, not only do we have Buddy with us today, but in the background, uh, we will have Ian Matthew, um, longtime expert in Plant 3D as well, answering questions. And I'll be giving you details about those in a moment as well. Um, I also want to let you know about our next webcast, which is coming up on March 7th, same time, 12 to 1 Eastern. Um, I'll be kind of hosting that webcast, and this is kind of a special uh, a special follow-up, we're calling it a post-game show, to the InfraWorks Design Slam that took place at Autodesk University last November. And uh, it was really, really cool and exciting. We had three customer contestants, Matt, Dan, and Chris, who went head-to-head. -head. They only had 15 minutes to design a development on Mars. And we're going to talk to those guys. I mean, what they did was just amazing. And that's why I asked them to come on and do uh, kind of a an interview based show with us so they could tell us like how did they come up with this stuff how did they prepare for this how were they able to actually pull off designing the development that they did and what amounted to 15 minutes they had three five minute rounds and um, so you're gonna hear from these guys their tips and tricks how they prepared the, the way they develop content um, you know how they how they thought about the project and uh, these are three of the most advanced InfraWorks users anywhere so they've got some really good stuff to, to share and of course you'll be able to ask them questions and um, you know we'll get some some mind share from some of the best InfraWorks users out there so watch for the registration information on that it's going to come in your email because you're registered for this um, webcast you're, you're on our email list for upcoming webcasts you can also look at the community uh, community center civil-community.autodesk.com and various social media outlets as well for information on that webcast. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that webcast. If you have ideas for topics for future webcasts, please let us know what they are. You can just jump into the questions panel on your GoToWebinar interface right now and say, I'd love to see such and such as a future webcast topic. We make a list of those every webcast and uh, that helps us determine you know, what, what we want to present on in the future. So please let us know what's on your mind there. Uh, make sure you visit the Autodesk Civil Engineering Community Center. Um, this is something that I personally work on, I'm very, very proud of and excited about. Uh, it's a central hub for all things civil engineering that, that relate to Autodesk. Of course, a lot about our software. A lot of it comes from users of the software, tips and tricks, webcasts that we've done, webcasts that our partners do, just tons and tons of content. Uh, it's all it's based on what's most current and what's up to date so you'll see news up there and uh, recent posts to the gallery from our customers things that are trending on social media it's just a you know a great site to check every day or at least a couple times a day to see what the buzz is about in the civil engineering community so uh, definitely bookmark that page it's civil-community.autodesk.com that's the place where you can actually go back and view all the recordings of our prior webcasts as well so just tons and tons of content there that's uh, sure to help you out. 
Uh, I don't believe we're going to get into anything preview or labs or forward looking today, but just in case we do, um, just know that anything, any features that we're talking about that we're working on or that are in beta or are coming in a new release, there's no guarantee that those features will actually exist until you really for real see them in an actual supported release is basically what the first bullet is saying and uh, don't make any purchasing decisions on anything that's forward-looking or or in beta or in development boring legal stuff we encourage you to ask questions we want to keep Ian busy in the background I'll also uh, be helping out uh, on general questions um, so uh, please feel free don't hold back use your questions window unfortunately our audience is too big to open the phone lines and, and have questions out loud but um, if Ian sees a theme developing or a particularly interesting or timely question during uh, during Buddy's presentation he'll go ahead and interrupt him and say hey we've got a, a good one out here can you can you talk about this and um, we'll also uh, try to have some time at the end for a few questions, but um, also ongoing throughout the presentation, Ian and myself will be working in the background answering those questions. So with that, I'm going to turn over the floor to Buddy. And uh, Buddy, you now have the stage, and um, you can share your screen. Thanks, Eric. I My pleasure. See if I can get, see if I can get this uh, going here. Yep, right now we're seeing your internet browser, and now I'm seeing a PowerPoint slide. Ah, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and skip through the first one here, and um, I don't reckon everyone likes to watch title screens for too long. Thanks uh, for joining everyone. My name is Buddy, and I am a uh, Autodesk SME uh, in regards to the plant solutions, the recap laser scan products, and uh, maybe a handful of other products related to the AutoCAD platform and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. A little bit of background on me. I'm about a 25-year pipe designer. I've been with Autodesk right at seven years, and for the most part, I'm located in the South Louisiana area, working for major chemical companies like uh, Huntsman, ICI, BASF. Those are the types of places that I've worked during my career. Uh, now that I'm on the uh, software side with Autodesk, it's, uh, it's really in uh, a, a much better understanding of how all of our products work together uh, to conform and, and produce an engineering data set that will get your projects done on time and under budget and that's always the goal. Uh, I'll click through this a little bit just to kind of set the agenda. We're going to look at the PNIDs and we're going to look at the 3D models and how they work together in terms of uh, cascading data from one end to the other. After we do all of that, uh, I'll bring it into Navisworks, and we'll look at the uh, the um, the ability for Navisworks to pick up heavy models and effortlessly move through them, uh, mainly for visualization, and uh, as well as it could also be used as checking as well. So we'll also cut some orthographic drawings for fabrication, and we'll do some annotations in those orthographic drawings, uh, and then we'll take your questions. So. Uh, any uh, anything that I missed there, Eric? No, that sounds great. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to uh, change my screen here, and we'll go straight into PNID. Let me know when you see it, Eric. I'm seeing it now. Oh, all right, great. Thanks for uh, keeping me up to date here. Okay, what we will see here in, in an AutoCAD PNID is, is we have one environment, and that environment allows you to toggle back and forth between a PNID environment and a 3D detailed design environment. First, what you'll see on the right is your tool palettes, and as I click through them, you'll see that there's different symbols that come out of the box, and they're not necessarily guided toward one particular industry or another, depending on what you're going to select as your standards. Out of the box, you will get PIPs standards. You will get ISO, ISA, DIN, JIS, ISO, and you can just go into regular drafting and design annotations and 3D basic modeling, and, and you can create your own. So you're really not limited to any of these uh, particular standards or workspaces. I can simply, and I'm just going to show you guys really quick how you can just create a circle on the screen 
And if I wanted that circle to be a particular block that I use regularly or just a block that I've already had and I've magically DD inserted it, I can simply right click on this object and convert it to an intelligent PNID object. And from here I can define that classification so it may be a filter or a furnace. I'll pick a miscellaneous equipment for now and hit uh, blade agitator, why not, and hit OK. It'll ask for an insertion point. You'll notice that as soon as I gave it an insertion point, it changed color, it changed layer. It is now an intelligent object. I can right click on it and I can assign a tag to it. So it is intelligent by any methods of measurement. But what I'll do here is I'll simply hit save. I'll go to an equipment tab. There we go. And I'll just drop and drag it into a tool palette. So what this, this demonstration really shows you is that any of the symbologies that you use today for your PNIDs or process flow diagrams can be easily converted to intelligent. You can define contact points on them to put nozzles if you needed to, and you can populate your own tool palettes with them. I'll go ahead and delete that. Just showing you some of the flexibility that you'll get, and you're not necessarily tethered to the uh, the symbols and the intelligent parts that are built into the program. You can completely use the versions that you're used to, to using today. So in this particular case, I'm going to pipe up from one of these uh, holding tanks or clarification tanks into our vertical pumps and into our clarifiers. So I'll simply select the lines tab in the tool palettes and I'll select one of the types of lines that we have. In this case, we have primary and we have secondary. We've got uh, new and existing. We've got uh, even jacketed pipe, uh, but you can really customize this tool palette to look just the way you'd like. So if you have particular types of piping you'd rather use, by all means, you could do it as well. I'll select primary. I'll come out near the bottom of the tank. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll come in here and we'll touch this node of this nozzle. Now you can see that if I'm really being critical of O snaps, I'm going to miss it. But when I select that node point, you'll see that plant PNID is going to fix that miss. And it'll make the adjustment for me. So if there's anyone on the call who really loves to be a stickler about snaps, this is going to be your friend. It's a command that's called S line ortho and it's defaultly activated. So you will always get that, uh, that snap conversion. I'll grab another line, pull it off of here, and we'll do the same thing on this node. There we go. And then we'll run this line from the node here. And we'll go to the, to the inlet here, which I think is right here. There we go. And we'll do the same thing with the discharge here. And what I'm really trying to show you is, is you're able to use this. Uh, you see how it fixed it as well right there just now. It's also routing the lines based on the direction in which I drew it. So your flow arrows are indicative of that. If I did indeed draw a line uh, the wrong direction, I'm just going to show you real quick. Uh, it's easy for me to right click on that line, go to schematic line, edit. And of all the different options that I have, including adding gaps and straightening segments, and I also can reverse the flow. So flow direction is indeed important for plant PNID. And if I hold my mouse over any particular line, you'll see that it's looking for direction. There's a to and a from and a tag information. Tag is something that uh, we can very much customize based on how you want your information to be uh, cantonated. So if you're looking for letters, dash, or you're looking for numbers, underscore, all of that can be customized the way you'd like. But the out-of-the-box version here will be size, spec, service, and so on. Uh, I'll go ahead and pick um, sanitary sewer, and we'll give it a line number, and we'll place an annotation on it. We'll hit the Assign button, and now I can place an annotation anywhere around here. And I'll move it a little bit, make it look a little cleaner. 
And so now when I hold my mouse over this line, it isn't just an annotation that we're reading. We're also seeing that the tag number is indeed defined in the database. So the tank doesn't have any information on it, so we'll define the tank. And we'll place a tag. And if I hold my mouse over the tank, we should see the tank number. Now all of this can be back checked through the data manager, which is our window inside the database. And we can look at tanks and we can see that there's a 2021. And if I select this little search window here, it'll zoom in on it for me and it'll highlight it as well. And this happens for anything that is inside of our, our PNIDs. If we want to find them, we can find them. And this is a standard feature that we have for finding the different objects and highlighting them in our PNIDs and 3D models. Now, we've got a line drawn in here. We can come over to our valve section and we can place the assortment of valves that come out of the box. I'll just grab a basic gate valve here. And you'll see the behavior is automated. It'll give uh, a numbering sequence to the valve. We can change that numbering sequence, whether it's either act, um, acquisition or selection or string. You can define how you want valves to be uh, numbered or named. And if you didn't want that, you can actually do it all manually yourself. So it all depends on how much you want to customize it. But it also inherited the line size of the pipeline that the valve was placed on. So if I've changed this line to a different size, and we'll change it to an 8 inch. And we'll give it the number. We'll place an annotation on it. And then when I place a valve in this line, you'll see that it'll inherit an 8 inch size. And right here we can simply select and add a tag to it and give it a new number. Oop, I messed that one up. Let's try that again. There we go. Sorry about that. So as, as you can see, line size uh, is dictating your inline assets uh, annotations. And if I look at the data manager again, and I go toward the uh, inline assets, you'll see that there's a 10 inch valve and an eight inch valve. And that's kind of how the PNID system works. Obviously we've got additional things here we can go through where you can place reducers, concentric and eccentric, host connections, uh, if I go back to the lines, you'll see that there's a whole host of instrumentation. So I could literally come in here and pick an instrumentation uh, style, uh, which I'm by any means uh, to measure, I am not a really good instrument guy, but that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll pick some type of switch here and give it a number. And then I can come into the line section and grab a electric signal. And from there, we can place it on the motor. And it's really that simple. If I go back to data manager, I can now find that instrumentation. I can find that field instrument and I can zoom right to it. And you'll see that every one of these categories that I've shown you in data manager has additional subclassification columns. So there's area and types, but there's also manufacturer, model number, supplier, general comments, uh, and I can add additional fields to these uh, rows and columns of data, or I can remove some of them. It all depends on how much information you want to track and how much you're willing to fill out and report on. If I change this view here from the current drawing data to project reports, you'll see that there's an out-of-the-box group of reports like control valve lists and document lists, equipment lists, uh, we also have instrument line list. So you're building your line list as you build your, your PNIDs. A summary version of that line list, nozzle lists, uh, and this entire list of reports here can be modified. Uh, 
You can delete them. You can create your own custom versions of them. All of that's possible through our user interface and our project setup. And then we can look at all of the PNID information. So if there's more than one PNID, we can look at all of the different things that are existing inside of those as well. All right, let me zoom extends here a little bit. And um, looking at the time check, I think I'm going to move to the 3D version side of this. Buddy, can I ask you to do one thing uh, before you go? Let's still go back into the PNID. I, one of our users asked about uh, whether you can just simply change line size and will the valves actually change as well. And I know that if you revert that line back to a 10 inch or whatever, I think that'll answer the question beautifully. Yes, sir. I can do it. I'll do a 10 inch right there. And you'll see the annotation immediately updated. And if I hold my mouse over it, which is the tooltip, which is being derived from the database, uh, it also shows two, 10 inches as well. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. So you don't have to break or delete. You can even grab a pump and move it around a little bit, and you'll see that the lines will adjust with it as well. We'll bring it down a little bit, but it's not made to do a whole lot of moving, but it is allowing you to move and still maintain connection. All right, let me zoom in and save. And then I'll go back to the model. And while you're moving in there, I'll just answer another question, which was about reducers. In the case of reducer, uh, once you insert the reducer, you select which is the reducing size, and everything downstream of that will be uh, have the line sizes changed. That That is correct. If you place a reducer, the PNID tool won't necessarily know which side is going to be larger or smaller, so it puts it as a size-on-size size reducer, if you will. Sounds a bit redundant, but it's kind of the, how it works. And then you can pick which side upstream or downstream of that fitting would be the size change. And once you've selected that size change, it propagates it throughout. Okay, I'm in my 3D model in here, and, you know, I... I will have to say that I am not an absolute expert in uh, in how to turn sanitary sewer into drinking water, and that's okay, but uh, this data set has been shared by some of those who do know how to do that. I am an expert in how to pipe this stuff up and use this software, so uh, I just want you guys to understand that I am going to show you how this piping system works, and there are three different ways to place equipment in Plant3D. And if I change my workspaces here to our 3D piping, you'll see our ribbons change and our tool palettes will change. And now what we have is the ability to change, if you look up here at the top, we we'll change which spec we're working in. So if we're working in a uh, different, whether it's PVC or some type of stainless or ductile iron, uh, we can change those specs out really easy. In this case, I'm looking at a ductile flange or a ductile mechanical joint, which is what I'm using today. You can change your line size based on what size availabilities are, are within that spec. And then, of course, you can change your line numbers. So if you have a line number specifically you want to stick with or one that's changing, you can hit route new line, or you can begin to route some of the lines that already do exist. Also, uh, we can look at our PNID list. So I can hit this little button here. Give it a sec. And you'll see here's our PNID with our line numbers attached. Uh, if there's any valves in here. So I'm just going to use this one really, really quick and show you how we can grab this line and hit place. And I'll just place a line here. And you'll notice that it's really just drag. Uh, manipulate the lines based on the direction you want to go. You can change the plane so that you can go up or down and change that, uh, that elevation. And now when I hold my mouse over this line, you'll see that the data from PNID transferred over into the 3D model. So now I'm looking at line number 5,000. That's two inch and it's a carbon steel 150 pound line. And I can also select this check valve and place it. And so now if I look at this check valve really close, I can hold my mouse over it and look at all of the data that's been propagated from the PNID into our 3D design model. 
And if I didn't want this particular one, I can simply hit the substitute button and change it to a different uh, a different type of check valve. So we'll pick a flanged one. So you don't have to delete, you don't have to erase and replace. You can simply select the little substitute grip and you can change it to the different types that you are more familiar with or that you need for this particular project. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll just leave that right there and I'll show you how I've got uh, some pumps in here. Three ways to place equipment. You can build your equipment through 3D modeling AutoCAD objects and then convert those objects. You can create with our equipment creation module that allows you to pick different types of uh, typical equipment and then manipulate that equipment based on shapes and trim, whether it's a stiffening ring or an access ladder and platform or uh, maybe a skirt around a, a particular uh, vertical vessel. And then you can select and define those properties behind each one of those parts before you place it. So you've got descriptions and material codes and design standards all the different things that come with those types of equipment. And then you've got the third way, which is building it in Inventor and then taking that Inventor model and bringing it into your plant 3D environment. I think this is a, a skid here. I think we have a pump as well. There we go. So you have the ability to define uh, objects that are not built inside of Plant 3D and turn those into objects for use here inside of your Plant 3D environment. This was done in Inventor. So the workflow is, is, is still there. Not only is it AutoCAD to AutoCAD, but it's Inventor to AutoCAD as well. In this case, we've got some, uh, some nozzles in here. Oh, I got the wrong spec defined. Let me change that. We can look at what this nozzle is by selecting that little pencil and we see that it's a 12 inch, 150 pound flat face. And from there we can look at our 12 inch mechanical joint. We'll turn the PID list off for now and we'll select, uh, oh, that's because it's a mechanical joint. Let's change that to flanged. Yeah, when, and that's a really great segue here, I wanted to make sure you guys understood that you cannot model things that are out of spec. So when you're selecting objects to design, if they do not meet the specification that is currently selected, you will not be able to model out of spec items. I'll pick this out and then I'm just going to touch the node of this one here. What that's going to do is that's going to give it an auto route feature. If it can fit it, if it can't fit it, we can simply manipulate it by dragging it out a little bit more, dragging the pipe back in a little bit more. All of this allows us the flexibility to make modifications on the fly. And it'll tell you, hey, you can't do that because of these particular reasons. In this case, it's looking for that flange connection. So it says this flange connection needs to be uh, trimmed up a little bit because of the fitting makeup in here. So you can always modify, you can always delete, and you can always reroute really quickly. Hang on, let me get in here and grab this part. There it is. And you can extend your lines back and forth. You'll see that you've got uh, a dynamic input here. So I can tab through these dynamic input parts and select how far I want this uh, particular pipe to stretch back to. I can select any one of these faces and connect to these parts and hit accept. And once I've accepted this, I can turn this 90 into a T by simply selecting one of the plus signs on the back side of it. And the mathematics for that conversion is already done by the software. I think this, no, this nozzle here wants to be a little different, but that's okay. We can get to it. The other thing we can do is we can connect to other items like this line here that's all already built. We can simply select it and touch this node right here. 
and you'll see that it's already done. You'll see that the line is set up so that every 20 feet there is a connection. And we can, we can connect to that existing line, and it'll put fittings in there for us just like that. So routing pipe and connecting pipe is relatively easy. And as we go through this, you'll see that we can assign the behavior of this pipe to be uh, every time that it is, I think this is an 8-inch line here. Uh, no, it's a 10-inch line. So the 10-inch line looks like it is going to be, uh, looks like it's a cyan color. This is a 12-inch line. It looks like it's going to be a magenta color. And we can manipulate our pipe design so that they land on the steel and support by the steel based on our input. And I'll show you what that means. Uh, if I look and do an ID on this, this beam here, you'll see it's 20 feet in the air. If I change to my pipe supports and I scroll down and I select a shoe, there's a pipe shoe, and I'll put that shoe right there. If I look at the shoe really close, it looks like the shoe isn't sitting on the steel at all. I simply select the shoe, go to the properties, scroll down, and you'll see that there's a properties pop out for that particular shoe. There's an SH dimension. I look at that SH dimension and change it to, I think it's 7.25 inches. And there it is. Now it's sitting on that steel. And this is just one of the really cool features of having a spec-driven design here. Um, with your tool palette and your ability to just place pipe supports. And we've got some more stuff down here we can route and I'll show you how this works. I'll grab this little pipe here and we don't have to get it dead center. We don't have to to challenge the uh, the drafter to get everything just right because we can manipulate it just right on the fly. So I'll select a spot and then I'll select the node. And you'll see that the auto route has found three different routings, and I can toggle through them. And I think that's the one I'm going to use and hit accept. So since the nozzle is on the dead center of this clarifier, you'll see that these routings look almost identical. And I can still manipulate them based on how I would like to, to proceed. So if I want to uh, add a branch or add a, uh, add a a high point drain, a bleed or drain, all those are easy. You just simply select it and you can hit a plus sign and continue to route pipe from a particular connection based on the connection criteria. Or you hit escape and cancel it out. I can grab another line from this uh, the sister pump and select that. And this is what's really cool is the ability to change those fittings from 90s to T's. I'll simply select that T right there and then select here. And hit accept. And so now I've got a dual pump system. Come up to the the tool palette and grab a block valve. And you know, to summarize all of this, I'm just trying to get uh, our audience today to understand that routing pipe, manipulating pipe, all of these things are really easy to do inside the software. Uh, and then from there, we can create orthographic drawings once all of this has been piped up. I'll go ahead and pipe up a little bit more, and you guys will see what I'm doing here. It makes a lot of sense as far as efficiency of your design. And then I'll select the node of that line, and you'll see that it routed it for me. And we can come in here to your pipe supports and add more support. So if we wanted to put some type of side clamp stanchion here, you'll see that the stanchion adjusted for the size of the pipe. Uh, if we wanted to put an adjustable one here, once I selected it, I can simply select the little grip node at the bottom, and I can tab to the elevation until the elevation is at zero feet. And you'll see it automatically adjust. Same thing with these angle irons. Zero feet. And you'll, make, you'll see it adjust automatically. And if I look at this from a side view, you'll see that it is in, indeed in line with the grade. 
and it works just like AutoCAD objects typically do work. If I look at my XRFs, there is a steel section in here that has been XRFed in. And if I look at my project manager at the top, I do have a steel drawn. And here is where all my steel resides. So if I make any changes to the steel, uh, let's grab this and move it a little bit. We'll move it uh, one foot over and hit save. We'll go back to the pipe model. And I'll get a little pop-up window down here at the bottom that says, hey, your steel XRF has been modified. Click here to reload it. And now it's done. And all I did was really move this little piece of steel over here a little bit. But the, the same workflow that you're used to in an AutoCAD environment still applies. XREF still work. Uh, you can access the project for many different people and have uh, instant feedback whenever they hit that save button. So the collaboration side of this is, is still really uh, AutoCAD based and it's still really reliable. Let's create a drawing. So I'll hit zoom extents. I'll hit save, and I'll come up here to the top and hit create ortho view. Now a couple of things are going to happen once I select what to define this. I'll see. Give it a name and hit OK. It prepares our title block in our borders area, and then it goes, goes back to the 3D model and it puts a 3D environment around the model. Uh, in this case, we have paper check turned on, cut pipe symbols. I'm going to move this down out of the way. We can select what do we want to take a view of. So in this case, we'll pick a top view, and you'll see that the top part of the cube is now kind of highlighted red. I'll change this to a front view, and we'll make sure that the top and the bottom of the cube is encompassing all the areas that we needed to to encompass for the, uh, the Z elevation. We can select additional models. In this case, I will pick the steel model to make sure it comes in on this image. And then we'll go ahead and change this view to the top. And we'll check the paper check. Paper check is how big will this viewport look on the size of the paper that we have selected. In this case, this viewport looks about the right size. We can change this though, if we didn't want everything in here, we wanted to cut the pipe rack in half here and just get this area here, we can do that. And we can hit okay. And what will happen here is that our, our area that we selected now is a bit small, but we place it on the sheet anyway. And I'll show you how we can edit that. We can simply select it and we can modify it or we can maximize it. We can clip it or we can hit edit view here. Lots of different ways to accomplish the same tasks. And we'll change the size to a little bit different. We'll go to an eighth. We'll check the paper. Looks much better and hit OK. And you'll see it change. And the really cool part here is that once I've got one view selected, I can double click inside of it, right click and annotate. So in this particular case, an equipment annotation. Well, what do you know? That tank has no tag number. So we'll go back to the model. I think you guys will get a, a deep sense of appreciation here. And we'll simply assign a tag to this tank. And we'll call it 5030. And we'll hit save. We'll go back to our ortho. And we will update this viewport. And watch that annotation. So it's intelligent from 3D all the way out to your 2D deliverables. We can double click inside, right click, and even and even more so um, the line numbers, the uh, bill of materials, the insulation call outs, if there's any tie point information, bottom of pipe, center of pipe, top of pipe, 
coordinate positions can all be placed right here. So here's the center of pipe elevation. So annotation, even bill of materials is capable. So if I look up here at the top, we've got a bill of materials you can select. I can select the viewport. I can define where the bill of materials will sit. And then I can bill material annotate by selecting the number one and defining all of the number ones in the viewport. And I can repeat that process as I go through into all of the different parts. And you go on so forth. I'm going to delete this just for now. And I will make you an adjacent view. Let's pick a front view of that same area. So we can come in here really close and you can see that it's all the different objects based on the point of view have been hidden or uh, processed so that it's graphically correct. And here's some of your uh, your base plates and pads for your structural components, uh, your equipment, your your uh, ladders and platforms. All of that's in here for you. And we can do this over and over again until we get all the different views and annotations that we want. We can even do an isometric point of view. There you go. Uh, and this is just as basic functionality. Obviously, you can fine tune it by going up here and setting up your tables and setting up your annotation preferences, the different text and leaders that you want to use. All of your dimension tools are here as well. So it's really built for you to, to come in here, set up your viewports, and really annotate and get your fabrication and erection drawings prepared in this environment. Now, one of the last phases of this is our Navisworks. And I will pull our Navisworks model up and I will append our structural model to it. And I don't know if anyone on the call is not familiar with Navisworks, but Navisworks is our visualization tools where I can simply open uh, DWGs, I can output NWDs or NWCs, even NWFs, which are Navis file types, for other users or stakeholders in your projects to review. We do have free viewers for a lot of our Navis files. And it allows us to not only look at these objects, but actually see some of the properties of these objects. So if I look over here in our Properties tab, you'll see that I know that this particular piece of steel that I selected is an 8 by 31 it's 240 inches long. Uh, here's its X, Y, and Z coordinates. So there's a lot of data that comes into a Navisworks environment. Just like I selected this pump here, and you'll see that the pump has the classification of pump. It has not been tagged. It's got flat based facing flanges. Uh, it is a new part. It is a 12 inch intake and 10 inch outtake uh, output pump nozzle structure that's based on 150 pound pressures. So as far as using Navisworks checkers, uh, project administrators, and as well as stakeholders, get a lot of data out of a, a Navisworks model. And then with Navisworks Manage, we also get clash detection. So we can simply select the clash detective. So we'll add a test. We'll select the steel of uh, the pipe and we'll clash it against the steel. We can select different types of clearances or hard or, or clashes, things that are really impacting or things that are supposed to sit on top of each other and just barely touch. You can kind of control all of that. Once you've selected the, the settings in which you are uh, most comfortable with, you can run that test. And what you'll see here is the results of that test in terms of, okay, it's finding a clash where this uh, base is actually hitting some of the concrete on the floor. Once that's been determined on the clash report, you can do a few things. You can sit there and say, okay, that's being reviewed, it's being approved, it's being resolved, and you can move on to the next one. And you'll see that there's an animation that takes place for every one of them that's clashing. 
So this deal is running into that deal. Uh, it's being reviewed. And so you can repeat this as you go through all of the different clashes that take place inside your structures and your models. You can even assign those clashes to different persons in your project to take care of that for you. All right, I'm going to stop out of there for right now. I've created an orthographic for you. I've routed some pipe. I've demonstrated some PNID functionality. Uh, Ian, do you have any other questions you want me to review? Uh, yes, I, I. While you've been working away there, there's been uh, a lot of questions asked, uh, some of which I've responded to uh, in the chat or in the Q and A windows. Um, but let me. Uh, First of all, um, one of the questions asked was, um, what about spec changes taking place uh, if you want to change from one spec to another? Um, so I'm just going to answer that by saying we have a, an ability to, uh, to change uh, models uh, through uh, spec updates, which will automatically update the components within um, within a model that are based on changes that have been made to a spec, uh, piping spec. Uh, since that model was actually modeled. We, we do timestamp, we know that the spec has changed. Selecting the spec update uh, command will actually update the line to the current spec settings, which may mean that some of the components would change automatically, um, and they may change into different types. So uh, as you see here on the screen, the spec update will actually identify for you which parts have been changed. You can decide manually whether you want to change them or not, um, and uh, you, by just simply checking the box there. A uh, question was asked as to whether or not I can change a, a line from one spec to another. The answer is again yes, because you would use uh, the properties uh, and then do a spec update. So, so yes, I think the answer is I, I've covered pretty well most of of. Uh, the, uh, the ability to work with specs. And I think that's one of the primary difference. Somebody asked about the question is, what do they think is the primary difference between um, PNID, I think they meant Plant 3D, and Revit MEP? And I think the, uh, the big answer is really the fact that Plant 3D is spec-driven, whereas uh, uh, Revit is more component-driven and family-driven. Um, so now, by using specs, you can ensure that you're using the right components that are that are uh, that match the properties of the, uh, the the type of line that you're actually trying to model. Um, and um, <clears throat> sorry, so uh, that I think uh, uh, covers one set of questions. Another. So set while of you were talking there, I went ahead and changed one uh, a piece of a line here from carbon steel to stainless steel just by selecting the properties palette and changing that. So uh, so changing a spec is ab absolutely easy, even changing a size is easy. Yeah. So you see there it automatically put in the uh the reducers. So I think you you know you can see how that's uh that's being driven by by our specs and uh, decisions being made by pipers. Um the the other th question that I know in this industry uh piping isometrics are not um are not actually uh, created a lot, um, but the uh, question is, can we um, can we create piping isometrics? The answer is yes. We have a capability of doing that. Uh, I see that you're going to do that while uh, while I'm talking. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that is that uh, while we uh, the question specifically asked about uh, isogen. And I just want to say that I'm currently working on a project um, where we are actually not interfacing to Isogen, but we're actually interfacing directly with piping fabricators who are using SpoolGen. So we're delivering the files that are being created automatically that create these ISOs that you see on the screen in digital form to the piping fabricators who are reading it into uh, into their their uh, particular uh, spool gen version and automatically creating the spools from the from a digital interface it's something that's ex extremely efficient very 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 good and it's working um, another question was about uh, creating content um, in particular it is to do with uh, equipment and uh, it's not just restricted to to uh, 
the content. Um, if you just go back into the model and just just pop open for me the um, the create equipment window. Um, now, just at the bottom there, in the bottom right, you see there's a, a, a little button there called templates. So what you can actually do inside of Plant 3D is you can create a, a whole set of using the screens here you can create a whole set of of various different types of equipment based on these uh, you can add primitives you can take primitives away and then you can save it as a template and you can use it um, it, it appears uh, you could click on the button then pull that type of uh, template uh, for use in, in further modeling um, so that that I think is that one question. Um, the other question that came up was um, as was working with Revit. Um, of course, uh, uh, you know you can import um, Revit models and use them as XREFs just in the same way. So you now have the ability to uh, work in a full BIM environment uh, with Plant 3D. Uh, and although this question wasn't um, wasn't uh, well, somebody actually here just asked a question are we using an OEM isogen or is it completely independent uh, our isometrics are completely independent they've delivered as part of the plant 3d product product with for an absolutely no extra charge um, the other question I've got here was about um, oh, excuse me an interface to hydraulic analysis um, the plant design the package does not include hydraulic analysis, uh, but we can interface uh, using the the, the, the PCF um, tool to in, to a number of different hydraulic analysis packages. The geometry is automatically ex, ex, exported using the PCF format. Yeah, and there's a there's there's a variety of uh, different pipe stress analysis that also use the PCF, and we have one that round trips with us in. Um, out of Texas called Piping Solutions. Okay, and then one thing I thought um, we should add here, by the way, um, is that what you're seeing here is uh, Plant 3D being used, um, and that those of you who who already have the AEC collections um, actually have the ability to use Plant 3D at no extra cost, so so you have the ability to do everything that uh, that's been shown here and more um, with the software you already have. All right, well, um, <clears throat> awesome work, both of you. Um, I got to say, buddy, I'm I'm not very well versed on Plant 3D myself, but what I've seen is uh, is really impressive here. So I definitely want to learn more, and I'm sure. The folks on the uh, that are viewing the the presentation are feeling the same way. Um, Ian, any more questions you want to air out before we uh, before I wrap things up? Yeah, I think there was one question. I just just bear with me a minute. Um, that just came in. Um, can slopes be added to pipe? Yes, you have the ability to actually uh, um, root with the slope. You can set the slope settings, and now your horizontal pipes will actually be sloped. Uh, does it calculate the pipe run weight and center of gravity? If your piping specs or catalogs contain weight and center of gravity information, the answer is yes. I think that's it. Yep, we do calculate COG, and we can control your rise over run slope right here. Oh, there was one other question too, um, which we didn't show. Somebody asked if we could actually create uh, drawing sections. The answer is yes, we can have zigzags in the sections. So uh, we didn't show it, but yes, you can do that. I think I've caught everything. I haven't. Nothing else has come up. So, all right, <laughs> great job, Ian. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'm going to take back um, presenter status here and share my screen one more time because I want to um, just remind everyone of our next webcast. So um, once again, our next webcast is on Wednesday, March 7th. It's the InfraWorks Design Slam post-game show. 
Um, like I said, it's a, it was a really exciting event at Autodesk University that uh, if you weren't able to make it out to Autodesk University this year, we're going to kind of bring it to bring it to you. So, um, you know, through the magic of the webcast interface, you can uh, log in and um, learn about how these um, these heavy hitters with InfraWorks prepared for this event and how they were able to pull off the amazing feat of designing a pretty major development in uh, in 15 minutes. So it's going to be, and these guys are all characters. They're they're great guys. They're funny. Um, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to uh, to ha to have that event. So I hope you'll all show up for that. Um, once again, I, I want to thank Buddy for a great presentation, Ian for doing such a great job of answering the questions, not only in the background in the questions panel, but also um, you know talking us through the answers. And and Buddy did a great job of uh, demonstrating what Ian was talking about. So just uh, top-notch presentation from both of you. Really appreciate it. want to thank all of you who attended today for giving us an hour of your busy schedules. Um, and I hope to see you at the next webcast and many more after that. Thanks. Have a great rest of your week. And uh, we'll see you next time.